morning, everyone. How many of you are excited in church this morning? Once again, can we give the Lord a hand? And can we just, uh, can we, can you just welcome the person beside you? Just uh, tell that person, glad to see you here, especially for those of you who don't know the people around you. You know, you're seated right near each other now. You know, we used to have like distances before yeah, there's physical distance, but now the closer the better. Anyway. Um, so we hope that you are well and that you are uh, not sick. Um, for those of you who are joining us here for the first time or maybe online, my name is Pastor El Marquez and I'm one of the pastors of this uh, church and we welcome you uh, home to Victory Alabang. Today we're going to be in for a treat, but before I introduce to you our speaker for our uh, preaching today, I do want to just acknowledge one of our dear friends and uh, you know our leader in the organization. I want to uh, honor and acknowledge the president of Every Nation Philippines and Victory Philippines, Pastor Gilbert Foliente. Uh, can we just... Yeah. Together with his family, I see Kathy and Alex and uh, Zoe there. And, um, you know, I get to work with him as well in EN. And so uh, glad to see you here. And uh, we are here to, um, to hear a fantastic uh, uh, message from God through this man. I want to acknowledge uh, and introduce to you our speaker this morning. He's part of our spiritual family. He's one of our leaders in our movement, uh, Pastor Keith Towers. Uh, for those of you who don't know him, he is the, currently the senior pastor of our High Point Church in Orlando, Florida, okay, where the magic uh, is there with this new world. Anyway, so uh, we were able to go there uh, in the previous World Conference, and they were gracious enough to host uh, delegates from all over the world, and they have a fantastic church there, Pastor Keith Tower is actually married to a wonderful, beautiful wife, Jennifer. And both of them are actually uh, working in the ministry, and they minister powerfully uh, in the area of uh, for family, relationships, mental health. And so uh, I'm excited to just be able to work with you in the future. Maybe uh, we'll import them again in the Philippines uh, uh, in the near future to do that. Talk about mental health, talk about anxiety, talk about families, and but not today, okay? We don't have really much time. But for those of you who don't know, just a trivia, uh, years back, Pastor Keith Towers also played as a center of the Orlando Magic, okay? He played with, uh, he played with Shaq O'Neal uh, during that time, and it's just amazing how, you know, yeah, he looks tall there, but wait till you see him here. But anyway, I was standing with him. Anyway, so I, I look like a dwarf or a midget, uh, you know, beside him. But it's amazing how God uses people wherever you are and how you are called. You know, he used to be a basketball player professionally in the NBA, but God called him out. And he's now full-time in the ministry. In fact, he's actually taken on, uh, he has a master's in psychology and he's working on his PhD for organizational leadership. So he's not only an athlete, he's a bright, a bright boy, <laughs> okay? He's a smart man, okay? There's just so much in that physique, you know, from top down. In fact, his, I was joking because he's actually, his fit foot size is actually the size of my shin. But anyway, so we were comparing size of body parts, but you know, anyway. So I believe that there is a word that God has deposited in him for all of us today. And Victor Alabang, I want you to have open hearts, open mind to receive from the word this, from the Lord this morning. I want us all to welcome with open hearts and excited, uh, you know, uh, gusto, okay? Uh, well, let's all welcome Pastor Keith Tower to minister the word this morning. Thank you, my friend. Appreciate you. Love there you, man. You go. To give you a perspective. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I've been following you online. Okay. I'm, I'm glad okay. that I I'll, I'll just fit on your stage. Stand beside. That's like perfect. Yeah. <laughs> just just stay right there the rest of the service. This will work really well. Yeah. I wanna, you know, I, I want to do this on your shoulder, but it's like the hip. <laughs> Take it away, Pastor. Yes. Keith. Thank you so much, Pastor Ariel. Good morning. Victory Alabang, how are you? It is such a pleasure. This is my first time to this Victory congregation. Uh, not my first time to the Philippines, but it's my first time to the Philippines in a, in a while. I haven't been here since 
gosh, man, way back in the BC days, you know, like before COVID, right? Way, way back then. And, you know, a, a lot has changed. Can we agree that a lot has changed since then? But you know something that hasn't changed? Victory is an amazing church. You want to know what else hasn't changed? Yeah, give yourself some applause. You're worthy. You know what else hasn't changed? You are led by world-class, amazing pastors and leaders. From the other side of the world, the home of Mickey Mouse, uh, we have followed what you're doing here and watched. And Pastor Ariel, you have led during this tumultuous season with such great courage. And I mean admirable wisdom and extraordinary grace. And my friend, on a happy Father's Day, you are a father of this house and you're a father of our movement. And man, I have so much respect and deep admiration for the work of God that you've done here. And uh, you are in very good hands with the pastors that you have. As, as Pastor mentioned, I did play for the Orlando Magic. I played professional basketball for seven years. And I played the same position as Shaquille O'Neal, which means I watched a lot of games from the front row because while I know the coach would be like, hmm, who should I put in now? Let's see, Shaq, Keith Tower, Shaq, Keith. Most of the time he picked Shaq, I don't know why. <laughs> so I didn't play much, but I did play at the most important times of the game. You know, those really crucial times when you're up by like 30, <laughs> right? The game is well over. There's nothing I can do to mess it up. And the coach would go, let's get Shaq out so he doesn't accidentally get hurt. And let's put Tower in. Maybe he'll hurt one of them. Who knows? <laughs> but, so I, I didn't play much, but, but in this important time, we had, we had a promotion with the Orlando Magic that they called the Mac Attack. And, and here's what it was. If the Orlando Magic won the game and scored 110 points. Now, this is before Steph Curry, right? Because 110 is easy these days. But this was the tough, physical 1990s NBA. So to score 110 points and win means that you pretty much ran the other team out of the gym. So the game was well over. But if we scored 110 and won, every person in the arena would get a free Big Mac from McDonald's. <laughs> now you had to stay all the way through the game and they would you know, punch your ticket on the way out and you'd get a free Big Mac. So which means even though we would be up by 20 and 30 points and the game was long decided, the arena would stay full. And what would happen is, you know, every point above 100, we'd score, let's say we, it's 100 points, you get to 102 and the announcer would come on and go, eight points for the Mac attack. And everybody would scream and yell, we'd score another basket, six points for the Mac attack. I, I checked into a game, it was, it was over, but I checked in, we had 106 points. Four points for the Mac attack. And we had the ball, but there, were just, there was just not enough time left. So we threw it in, and our guy came down and scored 108 points, two points for the Mac attack. And the place is going crazy, but there's literally like five seconds left. I mean, it's, it's essentially over, and normally a team would let the ball just sort of bounce and let the game end. But for whatever reason, the team takes the ball out and throws it in. And their guy goes racing up the court. And I'm thinking, listen, when you don't play very much, you get statistics however you can. So I'm thinking maybe the guy will just launch a shot and I'll go get a rebound and actually get in the scorebook. So sure enough, he comes down and he launches a shot with, you know, under a second left. It bounces off. I get the rebound. And it, I have no idea why, but they fouled me which means we have less than a half a second left on the clock, and I now have two free throws <laughs> with 20,000 Big Macs hanging in the balance. So I'm all the way down at the other end. I have to walk way up to this other free throw line, and it was the most weird, like, surreal experience. I'm, I'm walking, and you can just hear this murmur, like, starting at the bottom, just, this whisper going up through the crowds. And, I, and I'm like, ooh, I wonder what they're saying. I kind of listened, and they're going, who is that? 
<laughs> and then, uh, you know, they're like, tower, tower? So by the time I get to about half court, they, they've, they've figured out who I am. And you could hear everybody just at a low chant. They're going, tower, tower. <laughs> I get to about the top of the key, and now they're standing. Tower, tower. I step up to the free throw line. The ref is about to hand me the ball. And people are screaming, tower, tower. And the referee hands me the ball. And went deathly silent. <sighs> now you need to know this about me. I'm clutch under pressure. Just want you to know that. All right. So. Ball goes in. One point for the Mac attack. The place goes absolutely crazy. Tower, tower. True story. One, one lady yells, tower, will you marry me? I'm like, I'm like, it's a big Mac. It's not even jolly. Be like, raise your standards a little bit, right? My goodness. I have 20,000 brand new friends. I am the most popular guy in the arena. They literally love me. And I have one more shot. <laughs> tower, tower. They hand me the ball and shh. Now you need to know this about me. I've played in March Madness at the university level, played in state championships at the high school level, played in the NBA playoffs. And this was the most nervous I had ever been for any athletic event in my life, but I'm clutch. <laughs> I missed and I lost 20,000 friends like that. No more marriage proposals. <laughs> Boo, you're terrible. They're cursing me, cursing my wife, cursing my mom, cursing my pet dog, everybody. <sighs> you know, most of the things that we give our attention to, most of the things that like captivate our hearts, Heart. Most of the things that consume our prayer life, most of the things that like keep us up at night worrying about, even if we got them, they're about as fleeting as my 20,000 friends. Even if you got the things you're most cry, oh God, if you're real, I need this. Even if he answered, well, the thing that we tend to ask for is fleeting. We're going to look at one scripture today. And if you get nothing else from God or nothing else from his word, this has to get deeply embedded in the way we walk with him. Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 and 38, it's Jesus speaking, and he says this, and he said to them, said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. Message today is called Bad Romance. <laughs> Bad Romance. We're supposed to love, and he says, with all. All your heart, all your soul, all your mind. Mark includes all your strength. All. Church, if, if, if it is challenging for you to love God with all of you, I want you to know that doesn't make you a bad person. It just makes you a bad lover. And it sets you up to have a bad romance. Now this passage takes place on the final Tuesday of Jesus' life. 
And on this final Tuesday, there's two groups of people that didn't like each other, but they didn't like Jesus even more. So they actually kind of tag team together because even though they don't like each other, if we can get a common enemy, let's take him down. And we have two groups of people, these, a group called Pharisees and a group called Sadducees, and they're essentially religious leaders. And they had differences that kept them divided, but they were more concerned about Jesus. So they came together and tried to figure out how can we justify not having to follow that guy? So the Pharisees came up first and they're like, you know, we'll just ask him a question that'll trip him up. So they send one of their most you know, intellectual guys and he asked Jesus a question and I love how Matthew describes it. It says, Jesus silenced him. And that doesn't mean Jesus went, shh, like, shh, be quiet. It means Jesus gave him such a profound answer that the only thing that guy could do is go, like he was speechless with the wisdom that came out of Jesus' mouth. Now, the other group, the Sadducees, kind of laughed, right? Because they're like, ha, 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 we can get a double win here because now we can stump Jesus and people will think less both of Jesus and of the Pharisees who couldn't stump him. So they took their best shot, asked him a difficult question, and the text says that he silenced them as well. So now the Pharisees see an opportunity and they send one of their sharpest lawyer, which means a, a student of the law, not necessarily someone who deals in legal matters. He's a student of the Old Testament scriptures. And he has great command of them. And he comes to Jesus, the verse before this, and goes, I got the question that's gonna stump him. And he asks Jesus, which is the greatest commandment in the law? To which Jesus gave this brilliant answer right here, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is the greatest and first command. Which is the greatest commandment in the law? Now look at the profound nature of Jesus' answer. The greatest commandment is essentially to be very careful about what your heart loves the most. To be very careful about what your soul becomes devoted to. The greatest commandment is to become, be very careful about what your mind is captivated with. Now this answer is profound on so many levels. But among them is Jesus is quoting here. These weren't necessarily original, gosh, what should I answer in the moment? He's actually quoting a, a text of scripture called the Shema that's found in Deuteronomy chapter six, verse four. Now, the, the unique thing about the Shema is any religious scholar, anybody, honestly, of Jewish heritage at that time, but certainly the teachers of the law, certainly the Pharisee that asked him this question, they would recite out loud the Shema twice a day which means by the time this leader, if he's even in his 30s, which would have been young to be considered a lawyer, he has spoken this out over 21,000 times. These were words that tens of thousands of times he has heard, his, they've come out of his mouth, they've gone into his ears, but they have not yet dropped into his heart. And Jesus just goes right back at him. Understanding that the nature even of the question is essentially saying, Jesus, I'm so caught up in my religious affairs, in the importance of my office, in my political preferences, I'm so caught up in those that my love for the God who I regularly say to love with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, I'm choosing positional power and things of the world to enjoy more than the delight of a loving relationship with God. And the answer that Jesus gave that lawyer on that day really presents an interesting question to us today, and every day for that matter. What do you love more than anything? What is the one thing you love more than anything else? Let, let me ask it another way. What would break your heart the most if it was lost? That, that's how you know what you love. What would break your heart 
the most if it was lost. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. You shall love the Lord your God. Now, the word there, love, it's kind of an interesting word. You may have heard it before. It's a, it's a verb form of a noun type of love called agape. And most of the times when we hear of this idea of agape love, we usually tend to think of it as God's love directed toward us. Because agape love is a love that has no conditions. It's not a love dependent upon the response of the object of that love. It's not a love that like, you know, oh, when my heart goes pitter-patter, I just want to grant you love. Or when when I'm with you and I I sort of get the tinglies and the emotions, it's not an emotion-based love. It is a choice and a decision to consider the well-being of the object of agape love even above the well-being of the one who's extending that agape love. It's an amazing word. And, you know, the, the thing about this word choice is it doesn't even occur in the Old Testament, partially because it's a Greek word and the Old Testament's written in Hebrew, but also because until Jesus walks the earth, we don't even have to describe what that love looks like. Until Jesus walks, like we, we have adequate words for love. But when Jesus comes on the scene, they literally have to invent and ascribe a new word. In fact, it's not found, I mean, maybe in like one or two ancient texts outside of the Old Testament. It just doesn't exist. It's exclusive to Christianity. Because in the embodiment of Jesus, we see a love that is unlike anything else that has ever existed in human relationships. And here's what's crazy, is it's not just that Jesus agapes us, loves us without conditions, loves us in such a way that the object, us, unworthy though we are, he considers our well-being above his own. It's not just that he loves us this way, it blows my mind that he actually calls us to love him in the same way. Now, I don't know about you, but I love like John 3.16 love. You know what I mean? For God so loved, for God so agape if you will. It's not how it would be said, but that is the word choice. For God so agape the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes will not perish, but will have everlasting life. I love being the recipient of that kind of love. That God just, despite my unworthiness, despite my shortcomings, despite my failings, he lavishes without consideration of himself or without condition, he lavishes a love on me. I love that. But I don't know that I always love him that way myself. I don't know if you're like me, but sometimes I put conditions on my love toward God. You know, like if you hook me up with this amazing job, oh, I'll serve you. You know, if you grant us a child, oh, God, we're all in. But in the process of waiting, I'm not sure. I kind of have like one foot in. I'm most of the way, but I don't know that it would qualify as all because I'm still trying to decide if you're worthy of the best I can bring. Despite him saying, (laughs) I want it all. Now, I told you that this was called bad romance. And a bad romance is a romance, a love affair that goes one way. A bad romance is the type of relationship where one loves way more and in a much deeper and profound way than the other. Love tilts downhill rather than being reciprocated. And Jesus is not asking us to do the impossible. He's just telling us to reciprocate what he's already giving to us. A bad romance is when one loves the other 
and thinks about the other way more than it's reciprocal. And a bad romance becomes a toxic relationship when the one who loves the least uses the fact that one loves them more to get what they want. That's toxic. Oh, you like me. Well, I can use, I can hold back on my love and use the fact that you love me to get what I want. So I'm not only receiving your love, I'm manipulating your love to actually get an outcome that I want without having to reciprocate in return. It's a toxic relationship. And when Jesus makes what just might feel like an unreasonable command here, love me with all of you, agape me just like I agape you, he's just simply asking you to be decent and not engage in a toxic relationship with him. Are you all tracking with me this morning? Love the Lord your God, agape the love of the Lord with all your heart and then with all your soul. What does it mean to love God with all your soul? The soul is the place of your will and your emotions. So essentially, like in a sort of consuming way with your will and your emotions, you and I would consider the ways and heart of God. What do you most want to see happen? And when you most want to see it happen, from desire and will and emotion, that's something that you're loving with your soul. I'm here with my beautiful wife, Jennifer. <clears throat> and something you need to know about Jennifer is she is the world's biggest fan of American football. <laughs> we went to the University of Notre Dame, which in the US is the greatest American football program at the university level. She grew up in Green Bay, Wisconsin, which is the home of the many times Super Bowl champion Green Bay Packers. And my Jennifer loves Notre Dame football because she loves Jesus. And she loves Green Bay Packers football because Jesus loves her. And here's another thing you need to know about her, is when a football game is on, Jennifer's true superpower is revealed. <laughs> she has this incredible superpower that if she sits in exactly the right place, wears exactly the right shirt, exactly the right lucky socks, she can affect the outcome of a game being played multiple thousand kilometers away. It's amazing. She can sit right there, and if her team is doing good, she will not move from that spot for fear of her superpower. If she moves from here to, God forbid, the bathroom, it will affect the impact of the game. Here's the other thing. If she's sitting here and the team isn't doing well, oh, she's going to do something else because clearly that seat is not anointed enough, so she's going into the kitchen. And if she happens to be in the kitchen or in a different room and the game starts playing well, the team starts playing well, she won't come back. And I'll be like, babe, it's almost the end of the game. You need to come in. And she's like, no, no I can't. I don't want to mess it up. <laughs> That's so foolish. Because we all know that it's my lucky shirt that impacts the game. It's where I sit. I mean, <laughs> it's how loud I yell during the game that impacts whether or not they win. Now, so when we watch games, I don't know if you've ever had that experience. Maybe, probably not American football. Manny Pacquiao fight. Ooh, okay, come on. Right? So you're watching, and it's amazing how you're like ducking, right? You're kind of going, up, oh, duck, duck, duck. Right? And then all of a sudden, you're like, come on, baby. Come you're getting out of your seat. You're like, hit him, hit him. He starts taking him down. Boom, lands that one big blow. Down goes his opponent, and it's the world championship, and something in you just goes, yes, like you were a part of that. And you stand up, yeah. Just love God like that. Just love him like that. Where it consumes you, 
consumes your heart, consumes your mind. Your responses aren't something like, oh, I should probably worship today. It's like, whoo, there's the champ. Love him with all your soul and with all your mind. Your mind is what you're thinking about, what you're contemplating, what you're trying to understand, what you're reflecting on. What, what are you dreaming about? What's captured your thought life? What do you most ponder? Now, it could be good things, but Jesus wants all. He wants to be first on what you ponder. Our daughter was trying to make a big decision about which university to go to. And she's a, she's a volleyball player and multiple schools were recruiting her and she was down to her one dream school. And for whatever reason, we kept waiting and waiting for them to offer her her scholarship. And we thought it was coming and we knew it was coming and the day that they said it was coming passed. And can I tell you, Jennifer and I thought and talked about pretty much nothing else but our daughter's future, won't it be great? Now, my mind was divided in two. It was like, won't it be great if she gets this scholarship and goes to an Ivy League university and they'll set her up for the rest of the life and she'll be so smart and she'll be so rich and we can retire and she can take care of us. Won't that be amazing? But then this other thought in the same lane, but just a, a divergent would be like, but what if it doesn't happen? And we would find ourselves pondering and considering it to the point where when we'd pray, it'd be like, oh God, let today be the day. Oh God, if today isn't the day, help our daughter's heart. Help her be okay with that. Help her be patient. God, let it happen. But if it doesn't happen, help her not die. Love God like that. <laughs> to where that's all you think about. Just love him. With all your heart. Agape him. With all your soul with all your mind. Mark includes strength. So fight for him. And here's what Jesus said. He said, this command is the greatest. This command is first. This is the first and greatest command. What keeps you and I from being in a toxic relationship with God is keeping these commands first and elevating them to greatness or our, our highest priority. But because agape love doesn't simply stop with like, hey, like an expression of love, but it considers the well-being of another more, there's more to this passage than simply just love God more so you're not sort of the, the, the end user of a bad romance where he loves you more than you love him. The reason we keep this commandment first and the reason Jesus says it's the greatest is because not only does it prioritize how we relate with him, it prioritizes how we relate with everything else. Every other thing that will compete for attention with you falls under this command. Because if I love him with all my heart, all my soul, all my mind, all my strength, and this is the first and greatest command, it means the best, the highest, anything else can be prioritized in my life is second. It cannot also be first. When I allow something else to be first, here's, you're made in the image of God, which means this thing that God has called agape love that he can extend to us, because we are created in his image, we have the capacity to extend it to that which we most value. Nothing else in all of creation has the capacity, because it's not made in God's image, has the capacity to love in an agape manner. So here's what happens. If I, if I take something that's good, you know, love God, get it, especially on Sundays, you know, he's pretty awesome, but I have something else that's consuming me, something else that I'm just trying to will to happen, something that I just, you know, allow to be first, and God, he's near the top of the list, but if something else becomes first, because I'm made in the image of God, I now give to it agape love. 
And guess what it cannot, no matter what it is, guess what it cannot give back to you? Agape love. You know that job that you love and just had to have and is the single paramount focus of your life? You know what? It is not giving love back to you. It's giving you some benefit, but let's be clear. You are giving more to it than it is giving to you. It is demanding more of you than it is giving to you in return. Which means if I prioritize something above God, I give to it agape love, I love it more than it can reciprocate in love back to me, and I invest more into it than it is capable of bringing back to me, which means the very thing I love, I am now in a bad romance with it. I am now creating with something I most like and desire, I'm creating a toxic relationship where it is calling more from me than it's willing to give back or is capable of giving back in return. So I'm in a toxic relationship with the thing I love and by having it first over God, I'm now using the agape towards something other than God and I'm in a bad romance with him. That's a bummer. So the commands of God to love him first are not mean, they're not demanding, they're not restrictive, they are 100% for your best interest. When God says love him, it is so that when you choose to agape him, you're agapeing with one who is actually capable of outloving you but you are giving to him what it is that he asks back, and we have a true romance. There's nothing toxic in it. It is glorious. And now, by everything else being in second place, I no longer give to it the highest form of love that I have where I consider its interest over my own. I now love it appropriately. And I can invest into it what it is actually capable of investing back into me my friends, this passage isn't Jesus going, you need to do this. It's him calling you and I to human flourishing at the highest level. Yeah. In the areas that he demands, in your heart. Oh, there are broken hearts all around us. And he's giving us the recipe for the heart of man and woman to flourish, to be loved, to be satisfied, to be significant, to matter, to be meaningful to one who can properly love you back. And to not give that devotion to one that can't, which therefore shrivels up my heart. I'm giving the love of my soul to one who can reciprocate. And my soul, my mind, my emotions begin to flourish because I'm not insecure or worried about something that I'm giving my best to that can't return it. And my mind, gosh, there's gonna be mental challenges coming out of COVID all around the world. But you, people of Victory Alabang, are giving the love of your mind, the devotion of your mind to a God who can agape it back. Other things are important. They're just not most important. And when we see wilting and a lack of human flourishing almost every time, it's a violation of what Jesus said is first and greatest. And we create bad romances toward God and all around us. With that said, there's nothing wrong with pursuing things. Just, just keep them at second and below. There's nothing wrong with pondering brilliant ideas. God's giving you many. Just don't ponder them as a higher priority than pondering the ways and things of God. Everything else should be second or below. Now, let's conclude with this last thought. How do we keep a good thing from becoming the only thing? How do we keep things in proper priority? How do we avoid a toxic relationship from developing with the things of the world? How do we protect against unhealthy devotion to things that draw us from God? How do we avoid a bad romance? 
Remember, Jesus took this passage from a piece of scripture called the Shema. I told you that at the very beginning when he was addressing the religious leaders. And in Deuteronomy chapter 6, starting in verse 4, is where Jesus quoted this. And in that rich text that the average Hebrew would have recited twice a day, we can see exactly how to keep an appropriate relationship toward God and an appropriate relationship toward things of the world. Let's look there very quickly. Deuteronomy chapter 6, starting in verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Here we go. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. That's all he's ever asked. And these words, don't miss this, these words that I command you shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gate. How do we keep from having a toxic relationship both with the God who agape loves us and the things around us? Very simply, my friends, Keep God's words in front of you. Keep these words in front of you all the time. They're talking about when you rise, when you go, on your doorstep. He's essentially saying this, read your Bible. When? Pastor Keith, should I read it in the morning or at night? Yes. Absolutely. Well, which? Both. Oh, and a whole lot in between. And listen, I've, hey. In my last week here moving around Manila, I've been stuck in traffic. <laughs> Do you know what an amazing opportunity it is for you to put digital Bible and listen to it? These 30 minute, 40 minute, 50 minute driving from here to BGC in an hour and a half during rush hour, that is an hour and a half to be soaking in God's word. Just put it on play and listen. Let it wa- Paul describes the word, he says, let the word wash over you. If you want to not have a toxic relationship with other stuff, let this God wash the priorities and the toxins and the things competing for devotion off of your mind, off of your heart, out of your soul. Let this word just flush it all out. Well, Pastor Keith, you know I'm busy with my kids. I know, he actually addresses that in here. Talk to your kids about them. They don't want to sit down and read the Bible. That's fine when you're jumping in a pool. Do a big splash and go, hey, that's just like Jonah and the whale. (laughs) When my kids were young and wanted to wrestle, I'm like, we're not wrestling, baby. Get pillows. We're having a pillow fight. David and Goliath, right? You know, like. (laughs) So we're David and Goliath. They're just boom. I'm like, you know, we're just throwing pillows. We're talking about how God will defend you. And they bash me with a pillow and, you know, being seven feet tall, it's super helpful. Down goes Goliath. And we're talking about how great God is. And I know what you're thinking. Well, that works for you to be Goliath because you're huge. Well, if you're small, be Zacchaeus. I don't care. I mean, like, right? Come on. Just get this word in front of you. If you're out cutting the grass, if you're sweeping the street, if you're going for a run, just put it on and listen to it. When you wake up, let this word saturate you. And the more you get in this word, the more you see that God, he's not demanding something you, he is just simply worthy of it all. This becomes easier. Then the Shema goes on in verse 10 and says, And when the Lord your God brings you into the land he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give you with great, look at this, great and good cities that you did not build, and houses full of all good things that you did not fill, and cisterns that you did not dig, and vineyards and olive trees that you did not plant, and healing that you didn't ask for, and business ideas that you didn't even think to dream of. When God starts answering, and God starts blessing, and God starts blowing your mind. I mean, that's my paraphrase. And when you eat and are full, watch this, verse 12, then take care, lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of slavery. It is the Lord, your God you shall fear, him you shall serve, and by his name you shall swear. Take care. 
This Shema tells us to take care and not forget. How do I keep God first? Keep his word in front of me. And when he starts to bless you, you're fully devoted to him and he starts to bring the very thing you've been asking for. Just be careful. That's the time of greatest danger where you're going to be tempted to start to give agape to what he gave you rather than enjoy what he gave you in second place and keep your agape devoted to him. When he blesses you, that's the moment of danger. Now, if you're sitting here today and you say, that's really hard to love God with my heart, soul, mind, and strength, with all of it. It's really hard to keep him first. Can I just tell you that makes you normal? Makes you human. The Shema was written thousands of years ago. This is a thousand-year-old struggle that's common to all of humanity. And it was written and recited in the days of the Old Testament because the best that those believers had to be able to keep God first was a reminder and willpower. But you know, when Jesus came and walked the earth, he changed the game. And you don't have to just have a reminder and willpower. You have God's spirit and God's power. The power of the resurrection resides inside of you. You are actual recipients of an agape love that God asks back in return. This is how we were made to live. Fully, completely, utterly, at the core of our very being, devoted in love, devoted in will, devoted in thought to the God who first loved us. Jesus, I thank you for your sons and daughters all across this auditorium and watching online. I thank you that your love for them knows no limits, knows no bounds. And God, you invite us to not just be in a one-way relationship with you where we receive, although that is pretty darn awesome. But God, you somehow empower us to love you back with the same essence. Bless your sons and daughters all across this auditorium. Invite them into a true romance. In Jesus' name. I want to invite everybody to stand up. Anybody here blessed with the word today? Great reminder to always put him first. Always put him first. I'm just going to worship God and just respond. You drive away our fears and give us courage. Empowered by your spirit, by your strength. Proclaim to every place that you have risen. We will obey. We won't delay. We won't with hands lifted high say we will obey. We will obey. We won't delay. We will obey. We will obey.
Lord. Thank you for that wonderful word, Pastor Keith. We take that to heart. In fact, that is so interesting because, you know, he was talking about our heart. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, strength. We need to be careful with our heart. Tell the person beside you, be careful with your heart. You know, one of the wisest, in fact, the wisest man who ever lived by the name of Solomon wrote that in Proverbs, that the heart is the central of all things. It's a center of our being. The very person whom God blessed with wisdom, in fact, he was asking the Lord in this early stage of being a king, God is asking him, not with three wishes, but he was asking him, what do you want? And he said, instead of him asking for gold or victory over his enemies or fame, he said, Lord, give me wisdom. And because he asked the right thing, God gave him wisdom. And with that wisdom, God blessed him. In fact, if you were to compare the billions uh, the, the money of Solomon compared to maybe modern billionaires, I don't know, at that level, maybe he is still the, in that level, the most, rich, the richest man that ever lived because God blessed him. How many of you know that God has no problem blessing any of us? Be careful with our heart. Be careful with your heart. But what's amazing as I was going through that and, you know, trying it through the message of Pastor Keith, God really has wanting to bless His people from the very start, from the time He created. And He wants to preserve this love relationship. And as I was going through the scriptures, 1 Kings chapter 11 verse 4, I was just struck with this statement that all of these things that was given to Solomon by God captured his heart. that they started turning his heart away from God. And God was displeased with that. And the Bible just said, because he did not obey God just like his father David did, who loved the Lord, his heart, with, the, with all his heart. He was a man after God's own heart. David was not as rich as Solomon. He was not as wise as Solomon, yet he loved God with all his heart. He made reference and a comparison be between this man who was so rich, who was so wise, compared to his man, David. There's a reason why God has continued to preserve Israel because of his covenant with David, because of the way David reciprocated the love of God to him. Yes, he blew it with Bathsheba. Yes, he had Uriah killed. But yet, he was an imperfect king. Yet, God has seen his heart. May we be a people that would love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Amen. Can we all lift up our heart? I mean, our hands to the Lord as a, you know, as a heart of surrender. Father God, we just come before you today with lifted hands and with lifted hearts. Lord, I know, God, that as we seek you, Lord God, you have no problem blessing your people and answering our prayers, God. But when that time comes, may we be reminded, Lord, that, Lord, all these things pale in comparison with the love that you have given to us first, which is the love of Jesus that He actually displayed on the cross, giving His very life for each and every one of us. Lord, as we lift up our hands to You, we surrender everything. Lord God, all the idols of our heart, Lord, I pray that not one piece of the blessing of God will be an idol in our life, God. And that they will pair as 
they will fall down the line because you are being upheld, God, as the one true God, as the one that we adore, as the one that we long for, Lord God, as the one that we want to give our whole heart to, Lord. And may you find in this place a people that will do that, God. We want to give you our whole heart, not half heart, not what's left over, but our whole heart, God. Thank you, Lord God. May you be pleased, Lord. Can you all put your hands down and bow your heads for the last time? I want to just pray. Maybe some of you are here for the first time. Maybe some of you are joining online. If you have not given your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ yet, you have not received His free gift of eternal life. And I want to just lead you into a time of prayer, a time of surrender. If you want to receive eternal life, and if you want to be forgiven of all, all your sins, I want you to just follow this simple prayer by speaking your prayer from your heart. Just follow alongside with me. Just say, Lord Jesus, I confess that I am a sinner and I need a Savior. Thank you for going to the cross to pay the penalty for my sins. And I thank you, Lord God, that today I am saved and I am forgiven. I confess that Jesus is Lord and I believe that He is raised from the dead. Therefore, today, I know that I am saved and I am given eternal life. And Lord, from this day on, I give you my whole heart because of what you have given to me on that cross. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Can we give the Lord a hand for all those who prayed? If, if you prayed that prayer, please reach out to us right after this service. For those of you who are joining us online, just go ahead and log on to our website. We'd love to connect with you and pray with you during the week, okay? Can we all lift up our hands for the last time? I want to give you a blessing as we go and get dismissed. Father, thank you so much for a wonderful reminder. The first and foremost, God, you are our Father who loved us and has given to us. Lord God, we want to say to you, Happy Father's Day. Thank you for the love of a Father given to us, your children, Lord God. Continue to bless your people, Lord, as we leave this place. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And the Lord turn His face toward you and grant you peace. May the love of our Heavenly Father and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody say, Amen. And amen. God bless you all.